I'm Sam Mags, and I'm just waiting to get stuck into Middle Earth. It can't come quick enough. I'm Jamie Adams, and I've been working full time as a panic merchant. And I'm Ian McAllister, and I've been spending time in hives of scum and villainy. And this is Brainwaves, bringing you the best in board game and tabletop gaming news. And these are the headlines for the week of the 18th of February, 2019. Bridge in troubled waters as top player suspended for doping. Steamy situation as Age of Steam comes back to Kickstarter, but whose game is it anyway? And Asmodee can't control its bears. All this and more on this week's Brainwaves. The world of Bridge this week has been rocked as one of its top players has been banned from the sport for doping. Gear Helgomo, a Norwegian-born and well-regarded top player, had drug tests taken in Orlando, Florida last year at a bridge competition. Uh, these co- these results have been double-checked and he tested positive for synthetic testosterone and the female fertility drug clomiphene. Now, you might be wondering why doping actually matters in the world of bridge. But bridge is officially an Olympic sport. Who knew? It therefore needs regulated by the International Olympic Committee, the IOC. It's been an Olympic sport since 1990. And although uh, the bridge organization has said that testosterone and this drug, uh, clomiphene, have no real bearing on the world of bridge, like it doesn't make you more focused, um, it's still a drug that is banned by the IOC. And therefore, this guy has been banned from Them's bridge. Them's the rules. Yeah, those are the rules. Geyer was unsure how the substance got into the system, but uh, after a little bit more questioning, he seems to think that it might have been through supplements given to him by a bodybuilder friend of his to lose weight, uh, and that the drugs may have been in that. Just an amazing story. (laughs) Well, there you go. Someone getting banned from playing bridge for taking testosterone. It's sad, really, though, isn't it? Because it is one of those things where the bridge committees and stuff have come out and said, yeah, it doesn't affect your gameplay in the slightest. Yeah, but it is just a case of well, that's the rules because it's part of the Olympic Committee of of games. I think I love the fact that it's an Olympic sport, and it's yes, yeah, it's brilliant, yeah. isn't it? It's a tabletop game that is an Olympic sport. There you go. I mean, you, you I can mean, play. Do you chess can play, players get do- you can play sports. Do top chess players get dope tested. And- do you- oh, chess boxers. Oh, that's true. Chess boxers, maybe. Yeah. yeah, yeah, maybe. And what what other? I mean, what other games? I mean, do top magic players get dope tested? Get dope oh, I be- tests? Uh, I believe Probably they do not. get. I believe competitive chess players do get drug tested. Ooh, interesting. I'll have to look into that. Well, we're staying with slightly contentious topics here at Brainwaves, as Martin Wallace, the designer of Wildlands and Discworld Ankh Morpork, amongst a lot of other games, has made several allegations regarding a recent Kickstarter that has emerged. The Kickstarter is of the game Age of Steam, produced by Eagle Games. Martin Wallace himself has posted on the Age of Steam Board Game Geek page, and I shall read what he has said here. As many of you will be relatively new to Board Game Geek, some of you may not be aware of the history behind Age of Steam. To cut to the chase, this game was stolen from me by John Borer and published without my consent by Eagle Griffin. I received no royalties from the sales of this game. The official version of this game is known as Steam, and the rights are held by FFG, Fantasy Flight Games. At some point in the future, they may be releasing a new version of this game. Just something to mull over. Pretty damning stuff there, I think you you might agree. So when was the original game released? Because if he's writing this now... Steam was released in 2009. So that's, you know, that's ten years ago. Uh, uh, Borer, Borer, uh, Mr. Borer, has a history of train-based design games and has released a lot of maps and expansions for age of steam and we have uh, we at brainwaves reached out to eagle griffin and fantasy flight games to just to sort out the truth of this matter sadly fantasy flight have not got back to us however eagle griffin uh, did reply and from their reply it seems that they have copyright and again i'll read from their statement we refer you to the u.s copyright office where age of steam is a registered copyright of mr john burrer and the u.s patent and trademark office where age of steam is a registered trademark of mr john burrer Eagle Games licensed the rights to publish Age of Steam from John Burrer in 2008. Eagle Games has published the game for the past 10 years with the kind consent of John Burrer and without further design attribution. 
So I think this is one of the things we need to go back to that we've, we've talked about in the past, which is, can you copyright game mechanics? You know, so obviously Martin Mollis here is saying that the rights for his game are held by Fantasy Flight Games, and they are looking to publish that in the future. The game's been stolen by John Boa and Eagle Griffin, and that was published 10 years ago as Age of Steam. Well, the thing is, like, this has been ar- ar- arbitrated in the past by the former CEO of Fantasy Flight Games, Christian Peterson. Uh, he... That we'll link to this in the show notes. He has previously stated he tried to arbitrate a mediation between Wallace and Boer. The judge in that case was uh, a, a gentleman called Dr. Franz Ben Odilong, a German game designer himself. He found in favour of Borer at the time. We, I don't have the exact details of the case there and I couldn't really find any sort of deeper information about exactly what happened during that case. But yeah, Bo- um, DeLong found in favour of Borer at that time and Wallace did, just didn't abide by the mediation. It's quite hard to untangle exactly what happened there because there's very few people really talking about it. So I don't know exactly what happened, but it seems that Borer does have the rights to it. Eagle Griffin bought those rights in good faith from Borer and are publishing a new version of Age of Steam and absolutely believe they have the right to. And by, for all intents and purposes, it looks like they do. Well, as always, that's something we've mentioned on the show this week, so we're likely to update you all if we see any news about it in the future. But this seems to be something that's been going on for 10 years, so who knows when that will happen. (laughs) Maybe we're the ones to finally break it, but I doubt it. We do a lot of news on the show about mergers, um, very often involving giant monopoly company, if you excuse the pun, Asmodee Games. But this time... (laughs) <laughs> I've just got disapproving looks from my co-hosts. Are you um, di- no, you're not having disapproving looks from me. Just me. <laughs> this time we're talking about someone leaving the Asmodee group, and that is Heidelberg Games. They're a German company that joined forces with Asmodee back in 2017 to do some distribution stuff, assumingly around, around Germany and some of Europe. But now they're just parting ways for Heidelberg to go off and be their own independent company. To be honest, not much more has been said about that. I suppose it's just between the two of those companies. I suppose the question is, are we going to see more things like this happen? Has board gaming got to the point where we have got a couple of companies who own everyone and now a lot of people are going to go off and and do it for themselves? You know, is it maybe going the way that a lot of independent music record labels and things have gone? Stuff like that. Potentially, I mean, as the board gaming pie gets larger, as there's more money in there, it might be in smaller companies' interest to try and go out on their own a little bit and try and grab a little bit bigger piece of that pie for themselves rather than getting whatever they get through Asmodee's system. Who knows? So I, th- I think we'll still see more mergers than we will splits, but it's interesting to see a small company going out on their own, and we wish them all the best for that. Absolutely we do. Stephen King's novel It was famously turned into a TV show in the late 80s, early 90s, starring Tim Curry. And as again, last year came out as a new film with Alexander Skarsgård as Pennywise, the Dancing Clown. And we've got a sequel coming this year, It Chapter 2. And you may be wondering, why are you talking about films? This is not a film podcast. This is a board game podcast. Of course it is. And the reason I'm talking about it is... It is getting the board game treatment. Dun, 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 dun. Series of board game releases tied into the film are being released, including Cluedo and your favourite and mine, Monopoly. Alongside this is one new game called It, Evil Below. I'm afraid there's no word on publisher or designer yet. All we know is a little tagline. Hasbro, surely. No, Monopoly and Cluedo, definitely. But It, Evil Below. <laughs> Remember last podcast we were talking about uh, the company that got bought by Funko Pop and they had a lot of licensed stuff. Extremely so true. Maybe then. It Evil Below has been uh, labelled as a cooperative dice and card game that challenges all members of the Losers Club to work together and drive Pennywise back into hibernation. Now I've never read it nor have I ever seen it. Have either of you gentlemen? I saw the original TV series and it terrified I the hell out of me. I saw the latest film and my partner's currently listening to the audiobook extremely long that's all i really know um but apparently the book's fantastic and i i enjoyed the film that came out last year i mean it's it's interesting to see them not just going for like tight like direct tie-ins to established board game franchises like monopoly and cluedo and that they are actually producing a new game 
I mean, it might be quite simple, but it, it's 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 interesting to see them producing anything original off that as a board game rather than just turning out a Monopoly and Cluedo uh, Cluedo board with the it sort of sheen on top. Maybe we'll see more of that kind of thing tie-ins to big films uh, for for board games. Though most film tie-ins are famously terrible. Although the main purpose of gaming is to relax, have a good time with their friends, they can also be used in a way to help communities talk about uh, problems in the local area. And in the, the case of our next story, this has been used to help people in Istanbul talk about housing projects and development of the city. This has uh, this is a game called Imaginable Guidelines from designer Alexis Sanal. I hope I'm pronouncing that name correctly, an Istanbul-based architect. There was a lot of problems in Istanbul with companies established companies coming in and taking over green areas and developing the areas in ways that local people didn't like and she saw that both sides were entrenched in their positions leading to what's now saw as an endless loop of bad decisions guided by emotional perceptions uh, she picked up on how her children were playing card games like dixit and exploding kittens and sort of cooperating and helping each other out and she wanted to bring that aspect of games to problems in her city uh, the result is this game called Imaginable Guidelines, which is a deck of 101 colourful, oversized cards available in Turkish and English. We'll put a link to the game in the show notes. And the gameplay is consensus-based and allows participants to decide what topics are necessary, desirable, or irrelevant to particular problems in their community, allowing them to talk about things in a slightly, a slightly abstracted way rather than getting, in, getting into heated arguments that don't get anyone anywhere. They can talk about exactly what they want out of their local communities. And there's a lot of pop-up of this kind of game worldwide. Uh, in my local playtest group, uh, I have a lady who's brought along a game. She's involved in the food, sort of UK food chain, and she wants to get people around the table, like farmers, distributors, supermarkets around the table, to talk about the various issues with that food chain. And she has designed a game that she's been bringing along to the club to test and, and work out and that's really interesting and uh, there's also a couple other projects uh, mentioned in the art mentioned in this article i came across that includes play the city based in amsterdam and a game called method kit for cities by a stockholm based design for method kit and both both these companies are making games to help people sort of talk about issues in their so in their society in their towns and cities and yeah, it's a really cool uh, sort of expansion of the sort of board game genre, I think. What do you guys think? I think it's really interesting that these things are being used in multiple industries and multiple circles of people. That actually one way to get grown up adults talking sensibly is to turn it into a game, you know. Could you possibly be referencing anything, Sam? <laughs> but it's strange, right? But hey, if that's what needs to be done, that's what needs to be done, and it seems to be working, and hey, th that's interesting. And these are the kind of things that I'd like to play, if that's even the right word, more of and look into. Play is definitely the right word, because it might you know take a complex issue, be it political, economical, social, whatever, if you not boil it down and reduce it, because that implies, you know, making it too simple and cutting out a lot of issues. But boiling it down to a game and you go, okay, these are some very defined mechanics. Get people around the table, play this game, talk about the game afterwards. Restoration Games has been having a very good run of luck lately. A game company set up by Rob Davio, the creator of the legacy mechanic and behind such games as Seafall, Pandemic Legacy and Betrayal at House on the Hill Legacy. Well, a lot of legacy games, funnily enough. His studio, Restoration Games, was founded to bring life back to old games that maybe have fallen out of people's radar. He feels they deserve a new lease of life. So far, the games that have been released are racing betting game Downforce and the hunk of plastic and marble chucking fun that is Fireball Island, The Curse of Vulcar. Now, they've announced a lot of new games recently over the past couple of months, and the newest announcement came out several days ago. The new game is called Unmatched Battle of Legends. If, you, if that doesn't sound familiar to you, it's a reworking of Star Wars Epic Duels, which is a game that became the basis for Heroescape, which might have a lot of folk excited about that. Not only is it going to be re a revitalization of this game, it'll be actually a line of products. Unmatched is a minis dueling game. A minis miniatures, I mean, sorry. And there's going to be different factions. Basically, you are playing a hero who has a unique deck of cards. So, for example, you're going to have people like 
Alice from Alice in Wonderland, or King Arthur, or Sinbad the Sailor. I've seen a Robin Hood and Bigfoot miniatures out there as well. That's just the first box that's coming out, and the different heroes you can swap and mix and match and play against whoever you want. The line of products, first ones is Le- Battle of Legends Volume 1. Uh, there's also going to be Buffy the Vampire Slayer. There's going to be Bruce Lee sets, and they're working with Mondo Games, who are publishers of The Thing, Infection at Outpost 31. Rob Dabo on Twitter was also hinting that they had some other licenses in the pipeline, but wouldn't be drawn on what. I always found these kind of things really strange. You know, like Hero Clicks working with all the factions under the sun and it all working together. And oh, what else does it? I'm sure that's not the only one. There's lots of them. But these, I think it ties. It, yeah, it ties into that sort of like geek nerd thing of like what if who you know, would yeah. win in a fight and kind I, of thing from like what I understand Buffy that's what Bruce Epic Lee. Jewels was the Star Wars game and I think that's kind of what Fantasy Flight kind of pushed when they announced Star Wars Destiny you know remember that game you used to play back in the day well this is kind of that you can put Count Dooku as a dice up against Yoda as a dice um, you know <laughs> and see what happens or old Obi-Wan or you whatever you sound so dismissive of that <laughs> But it's, yeah, no, I get what you say, it's that what-if thing. But I just don't... <clears throat> I don't really get the whole everything coming together thing, you know, personally. You know, have you, you played Bruce Lee you, as well? Sam, have you played like, Smash Up? No, I haven't. Neither have I, but I'm aware that that... <laughs> 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 I am aware I that you are putting be a great point excellent point, well made. No, my, no, my, no, my, no. My point is, it's first of all, it's very popular. It has a lot of expansions. It's bring together a lot of those disparate elements. It's bring together okay, hey, no, what do you feel it, like Cthulhu doesn't... or cowboys and zombies? But that doesn't use licensed materials as well. No, I'm but saying. sometimes it no, uses licensed materials bit... in all but name. Yeah. I mean, I think I think the big thing here will be because Star Wars Epic Jewels was the basis for Hero Escape. I mean, I've never played Hero Escape, but I know it has a huge fan base. So there's a lot of people that still play that game. There's still sort of organized play for it in tournaments and that kind of thing. And if this game can capture some of that crowd, it'll be massively successful. Absolutely. It's going to be absolutely huge. Hey, guys, you remind me of the babe. What babe? Babe with the power. What power? Power of voodoo. Voodoo. Well, the power of RPGs in this case. Yes, Ben Milton, designer of Maze Rats RPG and Oh, Name. Smoking Hot News just in. I think ha- I'm I think I'm finally ready to just quit the cast after that. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> That's not off the news trolley though, Sam. <laughs> that 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 was the final straw. We've done a lot worse than Carry that. Carry on, because it's interesting news. Uh, yeah, Ben Milton, designer of Maze Rats RPG and Nave tweeted uh, a couple of days ago that he had been hired to help out with the labyrinth rpg this is coming from publisher riverhorse games who have designed the mechanics and bell milton has written the story this is uh, he says this is 90 linked scenes and that the rpg sort of has a sort of quite a linked sort of scene structure to it it's got a 13 hour countdown clock which you have to beat so it sounds a lot more structured than other rpgs which might be good for new players now we have not had the best time with river horses games in the past the Pretty labyrinth board game was a sense. bit lackluster uh but the the certainly the my little pony rpg has done pretty well from what i understand uh licensed games are definitely river horses thing maybe this will be excellent i mean i can't i personally don't really have a desire to role play in that universe i love the film but the universe itself is just like well it yeah, seems okay. like the universe itself is the film quite frankly you know yeah. that is that it, uh, i get that i mean if it, if it's a more structured rpg you know, more along the lines of like a sort of choose your own adventure kind of thing with rp more rpg elements in it i can however, see that working what i what, what i take away from the board game that i think is probably going to come through here you know especially because they said it's link scenes 13 hour clock countdown i fully imagine that this is you're going to be playing through the film you know and because yeah. that's what the board game was you know it was very much you're just going to walk through the movie and at the end you have to say the thing that she says at the end to win and if you don't know that this is actually part of the game people that to win the game you just have to recite something and if you don't know what that thing is then you don't win the game it is on a card if you don't know wow, it i've never played the labyrinth board game but that's no no to, that's no, to be fair it it is on a card if you don't know Fair enough, but still, come on, that's not a mechanic, you know, and 
I, to be honest, I quite like the idea of 90 linked scenes and stuff, and maybe playing something that's very structured and railroaded can sometimes be good, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it just depends, absolutely, how much choice have you got within that, you know? Going from their previous board games that I've played, admittedly it is only the one, um, n- not particularly good impressions, but as you were saying, you know, the My Little Pony stuff that's out there has done great guns, but maybe is that because of the license more than anything that actually people just find it a big novelty to play in the my little pony universe and you know and that has a huge following in this culture in a sense you know that this kind of geek culture um so is that a big part of its success rather than the actual fact that it's an engaging rpg So guys, we regularly joke about Monopoly and it's been a very much running running joke essentially that joke? for the past joke for you this... think I joke about this, Sam? <laughs> this is my life Monopoly is my life. Have you not seen the tattoo of Go that I have on my arm? Mr. Monopoly on your it's, face. It's it's more the distur- it's the more the disturbing picture of Mr. Monopoly have behind you right now that is like mm. you le- yeah. have to look at that every time we cast. You leave Uncle Pennybags alone. So we talk about Monopoly on this quite a lot at the end of the show, announcing all the different franchises and cash-ins that Hasbro might be might be giving it. So, Monopoly's been endured for a very long time, and new versions of it have... It's not been endured, oh, sorry, it yeah. has endured. <laughs> no, oh, no, 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 you were both right. It it's has endured, endured for and it has, for some, it has been endured. Monopoly's endured for a very long time, and new versions of it, as this show is testament assessment 2 are always being released so why do we think it's endured for so long and can modern board games learn from its longevity what do you think i mean personally i think people keep buying monopoly because they just don't know any better really that's they really not been very introduced f- probably to the wider that's world of board fair, games I mean. I... and uh, i mean monopoly's terrible it's a terrible game but you you, you, say, you say, i mean if you want to play you it say, fair you say enough it's terrible uh, and but, yet but, 250 million sets played um, 37 languages it's been 95 Jamie, years Jamie people watch the X Factor I can't account for people's taste yeah I know Ian that's fine I think <laughs> I think one of the reasons that it's endured for quite a while is partly due to its you know it's 95 years since it's been around this year I think there is this connection across generations of a family so you can get a game Monopoly and it's a game that not only will your parents know how to play it your grandparents if they're still alive will know how to play it First of all, second of all, it lends into that human condition of you are all fighting for limited resources. There's a limited amount of property. It is all about taking risks. And you know what? If you mess up, you go into jail. Yeah, of course that's a problem. But you, but you get that emotional response. Maybe not as if it's actually happened, but you're getting some form of emotional response from it. So do you think it's sort of like the, the sort of like you mentioned the family thing, like parents playing it with their kids and that kind of thing. So do you think there's a quite a hard nostalgia factor there in the longevity of Monopoly and, it's, and how I'd, I'd much it's I'd say there definitely endured? is. I'd say another huge player in this is the fact that you can get it in just about any franchise you want. Yeah. So if you like, oh, we're a big Star Wars household, we do that. Or oh, I've got lots of little kids, we play the Disney version. Yeah. You know, And a, oh, any language you, know, you want the... as well. 37 languages it's been translated into. No, completely. And, and, and quite frankly... If it brings people around a table, yeah. then that's a good thing, surely, you know. Um, whether we think it's a good game or not, hey, in a sense, what does it matter? People are getting around the table, they're talking, they're interacting with each other, they're being social. You want to you also talk about good. it in terms of a learning yeah. tool. There's an article on the South China Morning Post from about five years ago, uh, written by a man by the name of Richard... A regular reader of no, that, are you doing? Interested. <laughs> written by a man called Richard Lord. And it's talking about, you know, how Monopoly came to dominate board games and partly it's it's it for this discussion it's how it's endured so much and he makes a point that as a learned tool for children it gives them a chance to handle money and make adult investment decisions uh, to practice investment and negotiation and there's no real danger okay. there's no danger of like real loss there all that's going to happen is you're going to go to jail or your big brother or your dad is going to mess you over because they're not going to give you bow street yeah, that's not a bad point. I mean, it teaches sort of basic mathematical skills and that kind of thing. There's there's obvious benefits to that at a young age. 
But do you think it's mo- do you think most of the sets are being bought for like the, obviously there'll be collectors out there buying every single version of Monopoly because that's just the world. But do you think the majority of sets are being bought for sorry younger children or like I early think teens is. or is it I th- being bought I th- by I adults? Think, yeah, I think mostly, it's being bought for must have been bought as presents for people it's been bought basically for presents i think it's been bought oh, for a wide range for that nostalgia factor but do, do we think like so what do we think like modern like sam's question was like came down to like can modern board games learn from that in any way or form what- i think as a general question you know can any other board game you know we're talking about 95 years since monopoly first came out can any other game do that i think the short, short of card games no. short of card games like poker basically we're in a game. We're in a gaming era where the board games that we think of as classics, okay, you, I'm talking your Ticket to Rides, your Carcassons, you think have been around yeah, for El, El yeah, Grande. I'm, that kind I'm, of thing. I'm saying you know, Sherlock Holmes Consultant Detective has been around a lot longer, but some of these games have been around for let's say 10, 15 years. Yeah, we're talking kind of late nineties for a lot of the real classics. You know, if you're talking, well, Settlers of Catan is mid nineties, and that's Sherlock, still Sherlock going Holmes, very Sherlock strong. Holmes is mid eighties. I mean, like I could see Carcassonne becoming like a, like this kind of thing because it already has franchise versions. There is a Star Wars Carcassonne. I could absolutely see that, but we, we won't know obviously because unless we invent a time machine and go forth into the future. But also, also something like Double we were talking about in the last cast that had sold a lot. That's got franchise versions as well. So I think the games that will become like the monopolies of future board game generations are things like that we are starting to see as classics that are those perennial favorites now are things like Carcassonne Double, things like Very that. Very possibly, yeah. And I suppose it all depends on, you know, it's so many factors, isn't it? It's, well, what did we play as a kid? Well, frankly, for me, what was out there when I was a kid that I knew? And it was Monopoly, you know, and then yeah. later. And I'd say it was only in about 2010 that I really started seeing kind of what board games were out there. And things like Fantasy Flight really coming onto the horizon properly with a lot of their... St- you know, when they got the Star Wars license, that's when it really opened me up to kind of what board games can be, quite frankly. You know, because that's what I was interested in. I was there in the Thunder's Edge days of Fantasy Flight games. I have like no that idea what that kids. means. But but, but I, th- I think, I think my, I think <laughs> my point is that why is it endured? It's something that is very simple, that combines the teaching tool of teaching kids, right, okay, the value's on two dice what do they add up to okay teaching basic arithmetic how much does this cost this property cost right that's again that's arithmetic you're using the money you've got negotiation um investment yep learning about loss it's something that and that nostalgic factor that has stayed there and you want to talk about board games of endured or games that have endured there will still be versions of Catan and Car- carcassonne coming out almost inevitably but there will also be monopoly Well, that's about all we have time for on this week's episode of Brainwaves. But just before we go, we got a little bit of news sent to us by Keith McLennan, who's a friend of the show and a local designer that I know. And he came across a rather expensive card. If you want to invest in card games, folks, then you should invest in classic Magic the Gathering cards because a Black Lotus in near mint condition just went for $166,000 or thereabouts. Uh, nearly double what the same card had gone for in similar condition just last July. So, yeah, we'd like to th- give a big shout out as usual to our executive producers, Lucky Sparrow Gaming Cafe, but especially this week because they made a lovely piece of fan art for us of a giant, giant brain and brainwaves board game. Uh, you can see that up on our Twitter feed. I will also put it up on the Facebook page tomorrow that is the 13th of march and you can have a look at that but it yeah just a lovely our first piece of fan art and we're really really happy with that it's thank you very much guys really thank appreciate you very much. yeah it's very surreal to see someone being creative over things that you've just kind of sat and chatted about for a year yeah. like it's very strange yeah re- very touched by that thank you so much guys we really really appreciate that if you would like to join the, uh, the Lucky Sparrow Game Cafe and become an executive bu- producer or just throw us a dollar or two, then you can check out our Patreon. That gives you access to the extended version of this cast. And believe me, this one is going to be pretty damn extended. It's going to be a long cast for the extended ver- version, folks. And $2 gets you access to our Idle Thoughts podcast, which is a monthly-ish podcast that Sam, Jamie and I put out just talking about the games we've played and what we've been enjoying. 
Thanks very much for listening. If you like what you've listened to, then the best way to help us out is just to share the podcast around on your social media platform of choice. And especially if you can drop us a review on your podcast platform or leave us a rating on iTunes if you are a fruit-based device user. You can also follow us on Twitter at The Giant Brain, Instagram at Giant Brain UK, Facebook The Giant Brain, and our website is giantbrain.co.uk. And if you'd like to get in touch with the show and put forward some suggestions for Brainstorm or anything else you'd like to see on the show, then get in touch with us or by email at giantbrainuk at gmail.com. Thank you very much.